as we look at this verse, I, I will be speaking, not like again, not just to dads or grand, granddads or great great granddads. Uh, I believe there's, you know, thinking of uh, in preparation for fathers to be, dads to be, grandparents to be, and granddads to be. So, so don't just say, well, this is just for dads, this is for granddads, and I'll just kind of. Uh, this is one thing, but I'll try to apply it to you too. But the first uh, thing I want to ask is, how do you rate your marriage? How do you rate your marriage? Three possible areas. I'm first and last. My first and last consideration is myself. That's number one. Number two. I will give as long as I receive, like a 50-50 contract. Number three, I will give requiring nothing in return. Which, uh, as you think of those three, which fits the biblical pattern? Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also gave, also loved the church and gave himself for it. I think it's pretty... Pretty obvious, the last one. I will give requiring nothing in return. This morning I want to consider four things or four aspects or ingredients um, as we think about the husband's role in marriage, first of all. Now we're not going to cover all four of these uh, today. Uh, one of them we'll cover tonight and Lord will next, next Sunday night we'll cover one. But see, there are four things I want you to keep in, in perspective here. First of all, there is a covenant relationship when we speak of marriage. You know, you can't be, you know, you think of a husband, uh, a father, all that, you know, without marriage, is that is not there. So there's a covenant relationship, there's a bond, there's a union. Then there's what we call headship, or uh, what we'll talk about the head and the body, or uh, how God has set up the, the husband as the head, okay? And then there's leadership. Are you leading your family? Uh, but also there's this word stewardship. Now let's just uh, go through these four. I just want to go, uh, just to give you like a, a whet your appetite, to see what we're, what we're meaning by these four, and then we'll, we'll dive into them more deeply as we go on, uh, the first one and second one to th this morning. But, but let me just show you what I mean. For example, uh, this uh, covenant relationship that we're talking about, marriage, okay? Uh, in, in Ephesians 5, verse 31, notice what it says there. For uh, this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall be joined unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. Uh, it's talking about leaving and cleaving, okay? But you see, let me show you here. Your marriage this morning, dear one, uh, husband, wife, but particularly the husbands, okay, um, it is uh, indivisible indivisible. You see, whenever you divide something by one, or you divide one by one, it's always going to be what? One. And this is the, this is the whole idea that, that God has joined you together, husband and wife, and it is indivisible. You can't divide it. It's also undividable. You see, what God has a joined together, you cannot divide. It's undividable, but also it's indissolvable. Is it indissolvable? Only at death. Only at death. Now, as we think of this uh, covenant relationship, I, I like the idea, and I still do. I mean, I know there's, there, there's some, uh, uh, like maybe Quebec, for example, moving away from this, that, that the, the wife takes the, the, the husband's name, the last name. What does that indicate? What does that signify? Well, again, it's no longer two. It's no longer two flesh, but one. And so this is, first of all, the covenant relationship really is, is the, the basis of all of this as we see uh, God in marriage and what God has instituted. But notice next, as we think of real quickly, headship. Headship. What is your, your body without your head? Well, that's, uh, that's a no-brainer, right? Yes. No head is nothing. But see, but think about this as a Christian. As a Christian, what are you without Christ? Your head. You'd say, well, there's no way. There's no way to exist. Wives, what are you without your husbands? Think of that for a minute. 
Wives, what are you without your husbands? Now we come to this word leadership real quickly. How does Christ lead the church? Where does this all begin? Well, it all begins, first of all, in that covenant relationship, marriage. You see, uh, uh, Christ and the church are one. Okay, uh, A husband and wife are one. They become one flesh. And there's this principle of leaving and cleaving. They become a new uh, family union. Unit, okay? And, and then we see, how does Christ lead the church? Well, there's objectively, we would say the Word of God, okay? Secondly, we would say subjectively by the Holy Spirit. God, Holy Spirit is, is, is dwelling in us. Third, we would say outwardly providential. But let me ask this. How does the husband lead his wife? How does the husband lead his wife? You see, are we left to uh, the way of the world, or, well, this is how my parents, or this is how my dad did it, this is how my grandfather did it, and this is how I'm going to leave my wife? No, no, we have to come to the Word of God. Finally, as we think of some, some more general comments, stewardship. And that's what we'll look at, Lord willing, next Sunday night. Stewardship means the husband's responsibility. If you was going to sum up what is your responsibility, or what will be your responsibility when you get married, what, how would you sum it up? Well, one man put it this way, we are to what? We are to provide and protect. Provide and protect one's wife. Now, how do you do that? Well, in, in a matter of leading, there has to be direction, there has to be goal setting, there has to be problem solving, there has to be decision making. See, after we get done here looking at the husband and uh, his headship, his leadership, uh, some of the young men will say, well, I don't know if I, these are pretty big shoes to fill. Yes, they are. But you see, you are able by God's grace. Any husband or any grandfather, they're able to be uh, what God wants them to be. Because first of all, you're made in the image of Christ. You're recreated in the image of Christ. And also you have God, Holy Spirit in you to enable you. And you have the Word of God. You have godly examples. Everything is on your side for the husband to be what they need to be. And so there are these, uh, you know, uh, provide and protect. There's leading, direction, goal setting. There's this idea of welfare. Meaning, taking care of, providing socially, spiritually, educationally, financially, physically. You see, when we think about taking on a wife, you say, uh, well, there, she has spiritual needs. She has emotional needs. She has material needs. It's, it's not like, well, uh, you know, all these things come upon your shoulders as, as a husband. There's growth. Every aspect of, of the maturity and the process of my wife and family's growth is, 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 is my concern. It's my business. Okay? And as we think about this idea of responsibility. You see, uh, we are to teach our children to the, 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 the boys to be men, okay? The, the girls to be women. And that we're, we're to teach them what, what family life is and what marriage is all about. You see, all these things are, 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 are the foundations of our society, but it's the foundation of the church, but also, dear ones, you see, we want to function as a godly, what, unit, husband and wife, godly children, all that, and we, we have it all here. We have it all here. Now, if you, if you, there in Ephesians 5, those are the common things about, we, we think about uh, 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 headship, leadership, stewardship, this uh, covenant relationship that we have, all those things we'll look at a little bit more deeper, okay? But I want to give you an outline, a simple outline that I thought was really neat of Ephesians chapter 5, verses 25 through 23. We read uh, more than that this morning, but I just want to give you an outline and uh, jot it down, but just think for a minute here. Uh, something in, uh, when you're in uh, Bible class or Bible college, okay, you come into a book, and then what the, what the instructor wants you to do is, is make a basic outline of the whole book. And that's not always easy, is it? I mean, I would have a hard time, uh, I think, with Job, uh, and for sure, <laughs> okay? But there, you know, it says other ones, okay? Uh, some, someone says, like, the book of James is really hard to outline. You get, you know, what, what is James' flow and the flow and stuff like that? But let me give you an outline a little bit here on verses 25 through 20, uh, 33, that is, in Ephesians 5. Notice the first thing. 
The how of the husband's love for his wife is found in verses 25 through 27. The how. Secondly, the why of the husband's love is going to be found in verses 28 through 37, uh, 33. Now, notice it's uh, in verse 28, this why is stated. In verse, uh, verses 29 through 30, it's illustrated. And in verse 31, it's symbolized. So there's the how of the husband's love and the why of the husband's love. And that's, again, uh, we, we look at verse 25, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. Well, how am I going to do that? Well, we have it here. But how, but why should I do that? And there we have that. But notice, you see, the how, when you think of the how of the husband's uh, love for his wife, the love that gives. The love that gives. The why is the love that cares. For example, in verse 29, it says how we're to care for our wives. We're to nourish and cherish them. Okay? Now again, uh, the love that is uh, one flesh, okay? It goes back to the idea of union, bond, covenant relationship. Now let, let's look back to five, chapter 5, verse 25 for a minute. After we, there is, there's a simple outline, okay? But I want you to see here, as you think about your duty this, this morning as a husband, uh, as a father, uh, to, to a wife, to, to children, to family, but especially to your wives, dear ones. It says, husbands, love your wives. You see, it is all about love. Now, sometimes we say, well, that's not how my marriage works out, or, you know, that's a, I do, do, you know maybe, maybe you say, well, we have to define what love is. You see, well, it's 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 a uh, it's a emotional, it's you know, it's feelings, it's uh, uh, it, there's more than that, okay? <coughs> but dear ones, when when we think about uh, our responsibility to, to our wives, it says, husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. I mean, one illustration was one man asked another man says. Uh, you know, I, I think I'm doing too much for my wife. I'm spoiling her. And the guy said, uh, Ephesians 5.25, uh, is this is what you're doing? And he says, no, I have a lot of work to do. It's love. It's love. <clears throat> Let's look at this first, uh, we've looked at covenant head relationship, okay? It basically, it's union, okay? Uh, one flesh. It's, it's the foundation. It's where it's all begins. You see, you can't be a husband. You can't have a family. You have to be married. You have to have a wife. All that is uh, foundational. And uh, I believe the, the idea of being one flesh is so important. You, you leave and you cleave. <laughs> you leave from your parents, your in-laws. You go over and now you're a new family unit, a husband and wife. There's new headship. There's new authority. It's a whole new unit unto God. And that's where we have to begin. Now, we think of this word headship. And uh, I was thinking about it, which, which comes first, headship or leadership? Well, I think, I, think, I think headship is there first. Because this is the position that God gives to husbands. Okay? Now, a covenant relationship, well, that's the marriage. But let me, you see, we see that in Ephesians 5.23. Notice what it says there. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the savior of the body. So it is, this is what we're talking about, headship. But no, turn if you would to uh, 1 Corinthians 11, verse 3, as we continue. It's a similar verse, okay? 1 Corinthians 11, verse 3, the Apostle Paul tells us, But I would have you know that the head of every man is Christ, and the head of, head of the woman is the man, and the head of Christ is God. Now, this idea of headship means there's, or, there's order. We could say it's a order, but also a delegated authority. Okay? Uh, I noticed that we have, uh, I, I've never listened, I've listened to some things from uh, Elizabeth Elliot. Uh, years ago, Kathy's had quite a few books and things of that sort from, from Elizabeth Elliot. Uh, but she writes in one of her books, she gives a definition of submission. Now, hold on, ladies. I'm not. This is about husbands, okay? 
It is. But you're going to have to see, you see, uh, before we, uh, we have to understand as husbands that we, we have this responsibility as headship, okay? We have to know what, what uh, the wife is to be doing, but also we have to know what we're supposed to be doing, first of all, over that. But it's all included. Submission. Giving up one's right to lead. That's what Elizabeth Elliot says. Submission is giving up one's right to lead. How is this... Uh, manifested, or how is this delegated authority manifested here as we think about headship? The, the wife in relationship to the husband. Let me read one verse that, that is really interesting. You're, if you're there in 1 Corinthians, uh, turn to 1 Corinthians 11, verse 7. 1 Corinthians 11, verse 7. Now, this is one of these verses that you kind of scratch your head and say, now notice what it says, For a man indeed ought not to cover his head. Now, this is prayer time. This is the, the, the context of prayer, okay? For a man indeed ought not to cover his head, for as much as he is the image and glory of God, but the woman is the glory of the man. Notice that. The woman is the glory of the man. Now, we're going to look at that verse, the, or that phrase, but the woman is the glory of the man, first of all, in headship, and then in leadership, and see how it's manifested, how it's, how it's, how it's exercised, how, how we see it, okay? Now, um, how is this, this uh, the glory, uh, uh, the, the, it says there, the, the, but the woman is the glory of the man. How is that manifested? How is this delegated authority, how is this headship uh, manifest. Well, first of all, she manifests the, the man or the husband's authority and will. Yes, the husband is an authority over the wife. Okay? Uh, there's only one other that's higher than the husband. That would be the Lord Jesus, right? See, that's why sometimes it's uh, and very important because you're sending your wife out to work in this very issue of getting on the authority of other men. I think that's very dangerous, okay? A lot of adultery happens that way. But you see, the idea is this. That she manifests the man or the husband's authority and will. Now, let, let's go on. Number two, she rules instead of, of the man or her husband in the home and over the children. Again, we're talking about this headship. She, you know, the husband is the head of the wife, but, she, but she says the, the wife is the glory of the man. And so how is that manifested in, in the matter of headship? Well, uh, she, she is there to, what? Um, delegated authority. She manifests her husband's authority and, and will. Uh, she rules in the stead of, of, of the man or husband. Uh, I often say, and I believe it's true, you disobey your mother. Children, you disobey your mother, you disobey me. You disobey me, you disobey God. Now this is all scriptural, right? On basis of scriptural uh, context, you know. I, I'm not saying that the, the, the husband, you can, uh, I can't delegate anything, I have to come to the scriptures. But you see, she rules in the stead of the man. Children, if you're disobeying your parent, your mother, you're disobeying me as the father. Okay? But also, she carries out man or the husband's will. Now remember I said submission. What was the definition? The wife, it says, uh, giving up one's right to lead. See, she, she's not there to, to exert her own will. She's not there to, to, to have a, her own way, or in that sense, okay? She's there what? Uh, she carries out the man or the husband's will. She's the help me. She's the co-manager. She's the co she, she in the matter of cooperation in leadership. Now, uh, turn if you would to Proverbs 31. I want, I'll show you the, 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 the Proverbs 31 wife there. And just some things she does. Her, her attitude is, and, and we'll see this more uh, tonight in, in the matter of leadership. And maybe this is a hard... Uh, concept in the sense of the, the woman is the glory of the man. You see, she is out. Pardon? The glory, she says, uh, let me get it. Uh, 
But the woman is the glory of the man. She is out to make the man look good. Now, wait a minute. How, uh, wives, think of that. The wives are out to make the husband look good. Proverbs 31, verse 11 and 12. The heart of the, the heart, Proverbs 31, verse 11 and 12, first of all. The heart of her husband does safely trust in her, so that he shall have no need of spoil. She will do him good and not evil all the days of her life. Now, so notice the confidence that he has. You know, the, the wife is, is, is uh, executing the will, his will, uh, providing there in the home and, and in the, the household, okay? The heart of her husband does safely trust in her, so that he shall have no need of spoil. Look at verse 23. Her husband is known in the gates when he sitteth among the elders of the land. And I believe that's part of, because they say, well, look at it, the home. Look at the wives. Look at the children. Uh, you must be doing something right, he says it to the husband. And he's saying to himself and to others, no, it's my wife. <laughs> You see, you see she, she's at home doing my will. She's, you know, she's executing uh, the plans and purposes that I have set down. You see, we're, we're in agreement. We're working together, okay? Verses 27 and 28, Proverbs 31, it says this. She looketh well to the ways of her household, and eateth not the bread of idleness. Her children rise up and, her, and call her blessed. Her husband also, and he praiseth her. Again, uh, you know, these three things. She, how is this headship uh, manifested? The, the husband is head over, the, head over the, uh, the wife, but the woman is the glory of the man. Well, she, 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 she is out to make the man look good, the husband look good. And, and how she does she do? How does she do this? Well, she manifests the, the husband's authority and will. She's not doing her own authority, her own will. Uh, she rules instead of the man. In, in the home, over the children, over the household. Uh, third, she, car she carries out the, her husband's will. It's to help me. co manager cooperation. So that's all part of headship. Husbands, it says you're, you're the head over the wife. Now, uh, again, you, you have to stop for a minute. Um, it says, but I would have you know that the head of every man is Christ, and the head of the woman is the man, and the head of Christ is God. You see, who, who is our head? Husbands. Who are, well, it's, it's the Lord Jesus, you see. It's not like that, well, well we just have to delegate that. You know, we, the, the authority comes from our head, and our headship. You see, am I making the Lord Jesus look good as a, as a, a husband and a father? And think of that. Now, we'll, we'll talk about this a little bit uh, tonight, but I think it's an important point. You see, God, Holy Spirit, does He glorify Himself? No, He glorifies what? The Son. Does the Lord Jesus glorify Himself? No, He glorifies the Father. Okay? And, and so in this idea where it says the, the woman is the glory of the man, you see, she's out to make the husband look good. She's out to do His will. And, 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 and it's a delegated authority. She's out to make her head look good. And with a husband, is out to make his head look good. And that's the way it is. Again, this, this idea of headship. The husband is to lead his wife, his family. If, if you and I, if we as husbands, do not lead our wives and family, someone will. Now think of that for a minute. Something that Pastor David said years ago when I was uh, my first first week of uh, teaching high school in uh, Mount Pisgah Christian High School. I was the uh, home uh, high school homeroom teacher. I taught math and other things. And he says to me, he says, Tom, if you don't lead the class, someone will. Boy, did I find out that quickly. But you see, that's the same thing in the home. Husband, listen, if you don't lead the home, someone will. Someone will. Now, notice, if the wife is to do her role, her job, her position, or help me, being the glory of the man, if she's going to make you look good, 
She needs to know your will, husband. She needs to know, uh, you know, we need to manifest that leadership, in, leadership qualities in the home, in the church, and in the world. And this is, I believe this is where, uh, as husbands, we fail. How do we fail? Well, in, in lead, not leading our homes, not leading our families, not, not leading our wives. You know, I, I can say how many times I've heard uh, dear Christian brothers tell me, well, I didn't know what it, I didn't know I was supposed to leave my home. I didn't know I was supposed to leave my home. Now we can say, well, that should be rare, right? I, I could see, even for myself, saying, well, how do I leave my home? That's pretty hard, isn't it? You see, you can go back to that word provide and protect. You see, my wife has uh, spiritual needs, she has emotional needs, she has material needs. Uh, you know, all these things of, you know, all those, uh, I mean, think of this in the beginning. Uh, let me just read it to you. Let's see, uh, it was uh, the one part about direction, uh, providing particular goal setting, problem solving, decision, decision making. Welfare, social, spiritually, educational, financial, physically, uh, growth, every aspect, you know, so, wow, that, it's just like, wow, man, this is too much. How can I do this? But see, uh, the problem is that, that we, many husbands are not leading their wives. They're not leading their homes. And, uh, and before we can really look at what areas the husband is to lead in, in matter of providing and protecting, we have to accept our God-given duty. Husbands, listen, men. You say, well, I, one day I want to be married. Okay? One day I want to have children. One day I, I want to lead about a, a wife. Here was, you see, the Bible says that you, you're going to have to, you're going to be the head. You're going to not only give an answer to God, to the Lord Jesus for your wife and your children. That's part of it. But there, there is this responsibility, this stewardship of all these things that, that I need to do. I'm so glad that God gives us grace, right? God gives us a new nature. God gives us God, Holy Spirit. God gives us the Word of God. God gives us godly examples. Uh, older saints in the Lord that will help us, okay? Now think of this, this idea of leading the homes. Uh, Kathy and I were talking about a, a while ago about uh, slavery uh, back in the 1800s. And the whole culture of slavery. Uh, African Americans, uh, African Americans, where the, the man was not really a, a vital part of the family. You know, it's like here a landowner owns the, the, uh, these slaves, okay, and the husband is there and he's, they, they have children and he's shipped off somewhere else, you know. Uh, splitting up the family, it, it just and it was just horrible. Okay, the the idea of the, the the husband was 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 going to procreate, have children, and then move on, and then never see uh, the mother or the children again, or the children, the, the men being parted out. That that was there, the, the, that was going on in slavery. But you see, after slavery was abolished, that culture went on. Now you see, in, in, in not, not in, uh, let's say, overall, in African Americans, you can see that uh, basically the wife rules the home. And uh, where, where is the dad? He's not there. Or she'll have uh, how many children by different husbands, different men. But see, this is the culture. That's a, and part of that reason of that overflow, and I believe that's from slavery, where the, the husband wasn't there. Okay? But you see, it's so good today that, uh, you know, Elijah has some uh, music that he listens to, some of these, these rappers, and I'm, uh, I'm not sure about the, the, the men at first, and I said, well, this is this music, I, I'm not, this is not my style for sure, you know? And uh, I, I'm trying to figure out where, where I can go with this. And so I said, well, Elijah, Check out the, these guys. Uh, some of these are African Americans. Some of the, uh, uh, what is their home life? What is their church life? I mean, tell me about something about their church, about their doctrine. Tell me about what, what they believe. And he came back and he says, well, these, these guys are really strong family men. They're married, they have children. They're African American. Okay, they, they're, they're good local church people. 
I mean, they believe in the, you know, they I said, well, that's, that sounds like me. Their, their doctrine is good, too. They're actually sovereign grace. A few of them. Okay? Well, you see, some would say, well, they just picked up the white man's religion. No, no. They've picked up the Bible. You see what I'm saying? They picked up the Bible. Well, I don't know what it, I don't know what it is to lead my family. These, these men do. They got it from the book. And it's, it is not a white man's religion. Well, there are, no, it's, it's, it's the Bible. It's what God says. That, that the headship, the husbands that lead the homes, stewardship, all this other thing. Now, we could, we could come maybe a little bit closer to our society, even in Cornwall. You see, young mothers today, they have children. Uh, every, for every child they get, they get a, they get a baby checked. Right? And uh, where, where are the husbands with all these young ladies in Cornwall? They call up and they say, well, you know, uh, my check is a little late or something, or my check is a little short. Can you give me some groceries? Can you help me out? And I say, where is your, my, my son doesn't have food for the, his lunch this week for school. And I say, where is his dad? You see, the state is his dad. The state has taken over the aspect of providing and protecting these young men, young women. And we let the, what? The young men, they're not dads, they're not, they're not out fulfilling their role. And dear ones, so when it says, like, well, I, I don't know what it is to lead my family. I didn't know was, I was responsible to lead my family. You know, we're hearing this from Christians too. Christians, Christian dads saying this. No, no, we have to take our God-ordained assignment as the Lord would want us to do it, seriously, with His grace, with His help. Again, you think about being a dad and being a husband, you know, leading, uh, headship, stewardship, all this aspect of marriage. Dear ones, first thing God gives you is a new nature. It's possible. Second thing the Lord gives you is a God Holy Spirit to dwell in you. The third thing God gives you is the Word of God. He gives you the church. He gives you older examples. You see, it, it, it's not easy, but it's not impossible to do it God's way. Remember I said, how would you rate your marriage this morning? My first and last consideration is myself. You say, well, that's not the biblical way. Second one, I will give as long as I receive. 50-50 contract. No, that's not really it either. I will give uh, requiring nothing in return. You see, that's agape love. You see, when we get to Ephesians 5 a little bit more about this stewardship, you're going to see a sacrificial love. You're going to see a purifying love, a giving love, a caring love. Uh, all these things that, 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 that the husband is responsible to do. You see, grace is there, brother. Grace is there. There's no excuse. Well, I didn't know I was supposed to lead my family. If you're not leading your family, someone else is. There are extremes in leadership for sure. You know, no leadership. I can't do that. I wasn't born a leader. But you see, uh, uh, someone else is going to lead for sure. Someone else would lead. That's the other point there. Well, maybe, maybe the wife will lead. Maybe the children will lead. The parents-in-law. Uh, again, this idea of leave and cleave is so important. You see, the, the, the covenant relationship, the marriage relationship is this. You see, you're, you're a new unit. You see, uh, the husband is to be the head. Now, I'm not saying that you don't honor your parents or your in-laws, things of that sort. That, 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 that's not biblical. But you see, it is on your shoulder, husband, to lead and be the head. Okay, as God requires. Now, all the resources that are available, I would be, uh, I would be diligent <laughs> in using those resources, okay? But see, there are extremes in leadership, no leadership, others lead, uh, the world's fleshly way, you know, there's the abusive, we talked about that uh, a while ago, you see, in, in Adam, fallen in Adam, uh, the world, uh, the, the part of the curse is that the man, the husband, wants to keep the wife down, uh, abusive, uh, dictator kind of thing. That's that's wrong. The 50-50 contract is wrong. Um, what about um, general democracy? Does that does that work in a home? 
You see, the dad has one vote, the wife has one vote. In my house, my kids have ten votes. And sometimes that doesn't work, does it? Well, see, let's see, um, when does God get a vote? You see, my father-in-law said uh, to his children, uh, and uh, it was good, he says, uh, this is not a democracy, this is a benevolent dictatorship. You see, it's a benevolent dictator. That's grace. You see, leave out benevolent. That's the fall. That's the curse. That's the, you know, the macho man. I'm just going to put my, my slave wife, I'm just going to put her down. She's, she's my servant. She's, she's just going to do my bidding. She, you know, and, and shut up, woman. I don't want to hear it. That's the world. That's the curse. No, but it's not a democracy. It's a benevolent grace dictatorship. There's no voting no voting. Why? Because the husband is the head. The father is the head. And uh, he's, he's, he's responsible to God personally. Let's go quickly. Some uh, final remarks on, on the headship here. Really, it's the need of all husbands and wives and children here. First of all, a mutual submission as unto the Lord. Know what that means? Giving up your rights to lead. It doesn't say giving up your equality. That's what the feminists think. Well, I'm a lesser person. No. You're not a lesser person because you're a wife or a child. No, no. You're, you're, if you're a believer, you, you're one with Christ. You can go into the presence of God. You're, you're a believer priest. But you see, when it comes to submission, mutual submission, you see, all of us give up our rights. Even the husband. You see, I have to submit to the Lord Jesus. I want to submit to the Lord Jesus. Does that come easy? No. But there is grace, okay? First thing, mutual submission. You see, uh, there's two areas. I, I call them creative and redemptive order. See, we have to get back to order. You see, sin brought disorder. The curse brought dis disorder, okay? You see, when we're talking about, for, <coughs> for men, we're talking about manhood and fatherhood. But you see, really, in redemptive order... Uh, we, we, we receive grace. We receive the Holy Spirit. We receive the Word of God. You see, we say, well, I like, I like marriage before the fall. Well, yeah, it was okay. But see, marriage after the fall and marriage under redemption is great, isn't it? Because we have this example. What is it? Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25. It says, Husbands, Love your wives even as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. You see, we, you know, how do I love my wife? How do I love? Well, here it is. Why should I do it? Well, we are one. Do I hate my body? Do I hate myself? No, no. I'm going to love my wife even as myself. You see, it's all there. That's all redemptive. It's under the redemptive work. See, it cannot be, dear ones, as we think about uh, uh, the need for all of us. I will, uh, the wife says, I will start submitting to my husband when he starts leading the home. I mean, if I, how many times have people, Christians have said that to me, Christian ladies. I will start submitting to my husband when he starts leading the home. Or the husband says, I will start leading when my wife submits. And usually what it is, is, that when, when either one says this, it's basically, uh, it's a selfishness thing, okay? They're not really want, they don't, they don't, do they do not really want to lead, <laughs> you see? It's a cop-out. They really don't want to submit, okay? You see, uh, they're, they're just saying, well, she won't submit to me my way. And uh, the wife says, he's, he's not leading, well, he, 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 he's not leading the way I want him to lead. Or, get out of the way, husband. Like, one illustration was good. Uh, they, this couple was in a, in, in a counseling session, premarital counseling session, session and uh, the, the, the counselor said, well, um, what happens when you have a problem? Or when you're going to have a problem? And, and the fiancé said, she didn't say much, and then the, the man said, uh, said, well, you know, we'll just... Uh, hug and kiss, and then we'll just do it my way. We'll just hug and kiss and make up, and we'll just do it my way. 
That's what they're saying. Well, if she would just submit, then I'd leave. No, no. Dear ones, your responsibility is to leave. And how, uh, wives, well, if you would just leave, I would submit. Well, no, no. You just submit as unto the Lord. I'll take care of your husband. For sure. Let me give you another thing here in this, as we think about uh, uh, the need for, for all. Final remarks here. Um, look at 1 Corinthians 11, 11 through 12. You know, they get this headship. Uh, feminist uh, world, uh, they hate the idea that the wife is under the authority of the husband. You see, uh, you see, the world, the UN, the feminists have tried so hard, and they've worked on it for years and years and years to, to liberate the women. You know, they have the right to vote, right to smoke, right to work, right to wear pants, right to do whatever they want to do. They don't have to submit in anything. Now they're working on the children, the same thing. They're, they're destroying all parental rights, where the state becomes the parent. And, and, the, and the children can do basically, you know, if I don't want to go to church today, I'm not going to church. And other things, okay? But there has to be a balance here, and this is what the scriptures give to us. 1 Corinthians 11, 11 through 12. That's what it says there. Nevertheless, neither is the man without the woman, neither the woman without the man in the Lord. For as the woman is of the man, even so is the man also by the woman, but all things of God. Now what did Paul say there? You see, it's not male chauvinism. We're not talking about that. Nor are we talking about feminism. No, we're not even talking about democracy. <laughs> okay? We're talking about a benevolent dictatorship. But in this, we have to remember mutual dependence upon each other. You see, we talk about marriage and, and family, we're talking about uh, husbands, provide and protect, we're talking about wives, uh, help meet. You see, there's mutual dependence. You see, you become one flesh. Remember I said, you are indivisible. You, you're indivisible, undividable. That's the word in, in the uh, dictionary there. But uh, also it is, uh, you are undissolvable. You see? And so there's this mutual dependence upon each other. And the only way it's going to work is to just accept God's way of doing it. Okay? Headship for the man. But there's also equality in, in spirituality. You know, the wife and the husband, uh, one before the Lord in Christ. We're not talking about uh, that the wife is, is a lesser person. or uh, No, no, no. Or, you know, uh, inferior. Uh, no, no. It's just that this is the way God has, has ordained it, okay? And so it's not, uh, it's not equality in spirituality, no, no. But it's with different roles and different design. God's roles and God's design, and we go back to manhood, womanhood, we go back to uh, fatherhood, we go back to motherhood, we go back to the family, marriage, all these, the way God has prescribed it is what will work with His grace and what brings glory and honor to the Lord. Now, in, in this idea of uh, biblical order and balance, you see, um, you know, it's, 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 for example, say, so, well, I don't need my wife. Yes, you do. Well, see, it's a, it's a humbling thought, okay? Uh, you're, you were, dear, dear man, you were born from your mother. Yes, you need, <laughs> you need the woman. You need the mother, okay? And this is what God has done. It's not to say, well, the man is the head of the woman, and I don't need the woman anymore. No, no, no. No, it, it is this, this mutual dependency. And in this uh, balance here, there always has to be, you have to maintain the gender, gender roles. What do I mean? That? Men, you ought to act and dress like men. There's manhood, there's fatherhood. Women, you ought to act and dress like women. Womanhood, motherhood. But you see, all that is being attacked in, in society. But dear ones, listen, husbands, listen to me. Fathers, listen to me. Teach your children so. You look at the bulletin. I got one up here, I think. Uh, you look at what uh, John MacArthur writes there. Is, it, is this true? Look there, it says, If you fail, Father, to teach your son to fear God, the devil will teach him to hate God. If you fail to teach your son to guard his mind, 
The devil will gl g gladly teach him to, to have an open mind. And you, you can go all the way down. And you see, uh, that's what we're supposed to do as we think about this, this balance and order. You see, uh, or go up to the next one. He says, the best way to, to be a good father to your children is to be a good husband to their mother. Your children are watching. Our children are watching us as husbands and dads. How do we treat our wives? How do we treat their mothers? Very important. So we have to maintain uh, this uh, gender roles. Um, again, it's very important. Let me uh, close with this illustration. If you were going to pick uh, one person in the Bible, in this matter, illustrate uh, headship, who would, you, who would you go to? Well, the one I picked was, was Abraham. Turn to Abraham. Genesis 18 for me. Genesis 18. Genesis 18, we begin in verse 17. See, in, in Genesis 18, we, we have uh, the, the issue of Sodom and Gomorrah, lots down in Sodom and Gomorrah, and Abraham is, is uh, there, uh, actually the Lord and two angels have come, and they're fellowshipping with uh, Abraham. Uh, this is where the promise of uh, uh, Sarah's going to have a child, okay? Now, notice, and so, uh, it says in verse 17, And the Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham that thing which I do? Notice, seeing that Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him. For I know him, that he will command his children and his household after him, and they will keep the way of the Lord to do justice and judgment, that the Lord may bring upon Abraham that which he has spoken of him. Now, no, it says, for I know him that he will command his children. This word command means to give orders, to give charge, to appoint. Not, not just his wife and children, but his whole household, right? That's what it says there. Notice, Abraham will lead. Why? Because God has put him in a position as the husband. Well, that's marriage. He's the husband, he's the head, and he's going to, going to lead. And how is he going to lead? Well, he's going to command. But also it says he's going to keep the way of the Lord, he's going to do justice and judgment, and there is going to be a condition there, obedience bring blessing. This is all a uh, picture of what a Abraham's going to do. He's going to lead because he is the head of the home. He's going to lead in worship, prayer, and uh, he's going to provide, and he's going to protect Sarah. And you say, wait a minute, uh, isn't there a better example in the Bible about a husband leading? Now think of Abraham for a minute. Can you think of two places he failed? Or three? Twice he failed, for sure, in going down once to Egypt and once to the Philistines. Genesis 12, verse 14, and Genesis 20. And both of those times, Abraham jeopardizes his wife, his family, and his household. You say, wow, man. Going down to Egypt, going down to the place of the Philistines, Elimelech, all that. You see, here we see Abraham, you know, it's a fit of unbelief. He's trusting the flesh. And, you know, and I think if you read 1 Peter chapter 3 about Abraham obeying uh, Sarah obeying Abraham. I think this is this is the issue where you see Sarah kind of knew. Well, Abraham, you're you're not leading the family, <laughs> but I'm going to submit. You ever run into that, wives, where the husband says, "I think this is the way to go," and find out, well, this is really not the way to go. But what do you do? Do you rebel? No, you submit like Sarah did. But see. Both times, Abraham jeopardized his wife, family, his household. You see, this is what costs uh, being out of the will of God. And it's interesting that God honors the marriage covenant, Abraham's, Abraham's headship, more than Abraham does. He, he said, well, you be my sister for a while, you know, then, you know, the, then we'll get through this mess. And, uh, and God honored Abraham's 
uh, marriage covenant. God honors Abraham's headship. He, he actually intervenes in the, in the uh, Elimina and in the one in Egypt. That was the first one. The second thing I believe in a matter of Abraham missing it, okay, not commanding, is that he gives into, his, into the wishes and desires of Sarah, not waiting on God. Well, go into Hagar. Uh, you know, uh, no, no, Abraham didn't wait. He got uh, the cart before the horse. But see, what about Abraham that is so deep is that in these instances, he does repent. He gets back right with God. Now, God has to expose his sin. He sets up an altar. He gets back into the promised land. He gets back into the will of God. He gets back to leading his wife, commanding his household as God would want him to do. That is Abraham. And I can, I can picture, you know, Abraham's a good illustration of every one of us as husbands this morning. We, we need to command our homes. We, we're, we're commanded because we're the head of the home and we're to lead, okay? We're to provide and protect our wives, our children. But we find ourselves, what? Giving into the flesh, giving into the will of the flesh, uh, giving into the advice uh, of, of, let's say, of your wife or other, other people and getting off track. And then what happens? We need to repent. We need to turn back and do what's right. Do what's right. So tonight, Lord willing, we'll look at leadership a little bit here. Husbands, my exhortation to you and men or husbands to be is this. You see, God, this standard is so high, isn't it? This standard is Ephesians 5, verse 25. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. That is, you know, it, it's like that, like I told that one guy. He says, I, I think I'm spoiling my wife, I'm giving her too much. And then the, the Christian brother says, pointing him to this verse, and he says, No, I, I'm not really even scratching uh, the surface. Uh, and, that, and that is how high it is, brother. It really is. So, but you see, there is, there's grace. Uh, there's a new nature, there's God, Holy Spirit, there's the Word of God, there's the Church of God, there's uh, godly examples that we can look at and follow, even like Abraham, and that, that this is what God commands us, and there's grace. Now, do you want to make God look good? Do you want to make the Lord Jesus look good? Isn't that, that's really what it's all about. Okay? Wives, how do you make... The Lord Jesus look good, you make your wife, your husband look good. That's that's hard, isn't it? Husbands, you make uh, you you make your uh, the Lord Jesus look good by what? Commanding your home, leading your home, being a good steward, uh, honoring your your marriage uh, as one flesh. All these things will glorify God, and God will bless. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your mercy this morning. Lord, uh, we pray for the, the husbands, the fathers, and the father for the young men here. As they see this uh, high and lofty example, as Christ died for the church and gave himself for it. Father, in these verses we see the how and the why of how we're to love our wives. And so, Lord, help us uh, not just to... Uh, academics and all this, we, we, can, we know what the Word says, but Lord, uh, give us grace to love our wives, even as ourselves. Lord, thank you for this time, thank you for the instruction from your Word. Bless it, and Lord, uh, give grace in every area, for every husband, for every father. Lord, we need you, and Lord, may we glorify you, may we honor you, may we look, make you look good in every way, for we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.